All right, open up in those Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 24, as we take our last message in this part of our study in the book of Exodus. We've, if you recall, when we started Exodus, we did our first series, which was called Passover, and then we shifted to the series we're in now called Sinai, and starting next week, we're going to start our third and final series in the book of Exodus called Tabernacle. As now, after today, the focus is going to shift to that portable worship tent that would be the forerunner of the temple. And it's going to be a great study, but for tonight, for those of you on Twitter, it's the last chance you get to use that hashtag CCC Sinai. So enjoy it, because we'll have a new one for you next week. Open up to Exodus chapter 24. Now, if you recall... Exodus chapters 22, or 21, 22, and 23, we call that the book of the covenant. We spent a good amount of time looking at these various laws and why they're there. And some of the feedback that I've gotten from so many of you is when you read the book of Exodus, it reads, sometimes you're like, okay, it's like a law, it's a law, it's a law. But we don't actually think about the ramifications of why those laws are there. And so we looked at things like um, when we neglect things, how that looks, uh, is our intent to do good or to do evil. We talked about things like that the way we treat someone has actually nothing to do with how we feel about them. And that's a huge lesson. So many people are like, man, Pastor Daniel, that's a really serious statement. Because so often how I feel about somebody dictates how I treat them. And Jesus said that we should love our enemies. So right and wrong is not dictated by emotions. It's dictated by the heart of God. And so we've been studying these things and seeing these things. In Exodus chapter 24, we find now that the children of Israel are going to affirm that covenant. God has been telling them, these are the parameters of our relationship. And the children of Israel are going to say, you know what, God? We are in. That's what what tonight's going to be all about. So look at what happens. In Exodus chapter 24, picking up in verse 1, it says, Now he said to Moses, come up to the Lord. You and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, or Abihu, depending on how you like to slabify that name, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins And half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Now, Notice in verse 1, the Lord is calling Moses to go up to the Lord, and he's supposed to bring people with him. He brings Aaron, who's his brother. He brings Nadab and Abihu, who were uh, Aaron's two oldest sons. And these sons were meant to be the next high priest. But if you remember from the book of Leviticus, I believe it's chapter 10, to make sure that in Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu, they offered profane fire before the Lord and they died. And we'll get to that a little bit in Leviticus chapter 10. But it's interesting now, Moses has been doing much of the interaction with the Lord. And now God's saying, look, I want you to bring other people. I want you to bring Aaron. I want you to bring Nadab and Abihu. I also want you to bring these elders with you. These 70 elders. And I want them to worship from afar. Now there's a couple things here. First, notice that now God's design, it had been mostly Moses or Moses and Aaron. And now you got some 74 people who God is summoning. Why? 
because that's how discipleship works. Nadab and Abihu were going to learn how to be high priests by watching their father, Aaron. The 70 elders were going to learn what it means to be a spiritual leader for the children of Israel by watching Moses and Aaron. You can call this apprenticeship, mentorship. It's something that as Christians, we should be very passionate about because this is exactly what Jesus did. When Jesus came on his great rescue plan, he didn't just come and do it all himself. He came and he got 12 disciples. And he said, come on, I want you to do the work of the ministry with me. Now, were these guys the most gifted in the land? Surely not. Did they have it all together? Surely not. Did they make a million mistakes? They sure did. But by the book of Acts, God is using each one of these men in very powerful ways. So notice that. And and this is an important uh, encouragement for all of us, that no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, you need to start inviting people along with you. That's how people learn. That's how they understand what it means to be a Christian, what it means to serve the Lord. I'm so grateful for my pastor. I got, when I got to this church in the Bay Area, I was 24 years old and I was a pretty new Christian and, and my pastor invited me over to his house. I'd never seen a godly marriage before. I never saw what godly child rearing looked like. And this man invited me over to his house and I ate dinner and I watched the way he spoke with his wife and I watched the way he talked with his kids. And then he'd be like, listen, I'm gonna go do a hospital call. Why don't you come along with me? And I remember being in the car being like, so what are we gonna do? He's like, you're gonna do nothing. You're just gonna watch. And if they ask you a question, you can answer them. But just watch, just pray. And it was awesome because he taught me how to do ministry by letting me join him on what God was calling him to do. And that is old school apprenticeship, discipleship. And I'll be honest with you, that's how we grow as believers, by being invited along. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. As you serve the Lord, don't do it alone. Invite somebody along with you. They don't even have to be useful. Just invite them along. And as you're serving the Lord and, you know, just talk to him about what you're doing. And what happens over time is that, I've heard it said that true ministry is caught. It's not taught. It's like a disease. Because all of a sudden, you go do it. You go do the ministry with someone and someone's blown away. Like, how that happened? You're like, I don't know. We prayed before we went in. We said, God, show up. God showed up. And we're all being like, Wow. So I love this now because it's not just God being like, come on, Moses, we're going to get real deep with the Lord. I'm going to teach you all these commandments and it's all for you because you're the spiritual giant in the land. He's like, no, no, I want you to bring Aaron with you. I want you to bring Nadab and Abihu, his sons. I want you to bring 70 elders and we're all going to come. Now, everyone's not going to do the same things, but God wants people along for the ride. So brothers, sisters, listen, take people along for the ride with you. Don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. You get a chance to nurture people. Help people understand. And listen, if you're the kind of person like, I just want to learn, just invite yourself along with people then. Jesus did it all. It's very Christ-like. Remember Jesus? He was walking and Zacchaeus is in the trees. like, Zacchaeus, come on down. We got to go eat at your house today. He has invited himself over. I mean, isn't that what Jesus did in your life? He just invited himself in. It's like knocking, like, hey, can I come in? You're like, oh, yeah, sure. And Jesus is like one of those guests. He just never leaves, you know? You invite him in. He stays the whole time. After a while, you're like, man, it was really great. It's great that he's around all the time. And I don't ever want him to go away. That's how Jesus works. So just invite yourself along. Invite yourself into it. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But I like this because because God wants other people to grow. It's not just about Moses and Aaron, who we've been seeing so much of. Now Nadab and Abihu and these 70 elders— They're all meant to be useful for God's kingdom. Now notice though, in verse two, he does say, Moses alone shall come near to the Lord and they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So don't miss this now. Everyone's supposed to come, but Moses is the mediator. Moses is the only one who's allowed into the holy presence of God. And this style of spirituality was put right into the whole DNA of the children of Israel. We're going to start finding when we look at chapters 25 and 26 
about the tabernacle, how there's going to be a veil between the holy place, which is where all the priests could go, and the holy of holies, where only the high priest could go, and all the people could only stay outside in the courtyard. So this all speaks of the holiness of God, but what happened when Jesus died on the cross? That veil between the holy place and the holy of holies was ripped, not from the bottom up, but from the top down. And so maybe back in the day, only certain people were allowed into the presence of God. Now, because of the dispensation of grace that we have, because of the finished work of Jesus, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you have free access. And you are holy, not because somebody did a special ceremony over you. You are holy because you have put your faith and trust in Jesus. And Jesus has cleansed you cleansed you on the inside. And I love this about the gospel, that no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, if you come to Jesus, you could have been the most raunchy, nasty person who ever lived, and Jesus sees you white as snow. Because the work of Jesus is that profound. And so for each one of us, you don't, brothers and sisters, you don't need to go through me or another pastor, or a priest, or a this, or a that, or a prophet, or an evangelist. You just go to Jesus. And Jesus is like, man, my doors are wide open. Just come on in. And that gospel scandalizes people. It blows. It's like, you're telling me I can have free access into the presence of God at any time simply by believing in Jesus? You know what the answer to that question is? Yes. It's really true. And those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus, we have experienced this. Where you or I, when we, when we get on the knees of our heart and we say, oh God, I want to know you. God says, ah, yeah, I want to know you too. I want you to know me. Everything about me. I want to share all of me with all of you for all the world. So brothers and sisters, don't think that there's a hierarchy into God's presence. If you're with Jesus... You got, you're on the guest list. You come in and out anytime you want, but let's go in and stay in. But at this point, at this point, it's only Moses going in. Now notice what happens. In verse three, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all of his judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Now notice that. Moses comes from the Lord. He says, look, this is, this is the deal. And all the people with one voice, totally united, said, yep, we'll do it all. So there's an affirmation. We want in on this. But notice what happens. It's a verbal expression of God's will. They say yes. Look what happens in verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning, and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent the young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And verse 6, Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord had said, we will do and be obedient. Notice, this covenant is twice affirmed. First time Moses told them, and they said, we'll do it. Then he goes and he writes it all down and he reads it to them. And then they say, yes, we'll do it and we'll be obedient. I think there's an important point here. That culture was not a literary culture. It was an oral culture. Most people didn't read, yet God still put it in a book. And I like that about the Lord. That is why here at Crossroads, and I believe in all of the churches that are profoundly passionate about God, God put it in a book. He put it in a book. He wanted to have a very real, very tangible representation See, and let's be honest. When we write something down, it has some power, doesn't it? When you sit down and you own it and you say, you know, like how many of you journal and you have to write down those really hard things about the garbage in your heart? It's one thing to see like, yeah, man, I'm really struggling. And you're real general. And then you go sit down, you write it down. And then it's there on a piece of paper and you got to look at it. You're like, yeah, ooh. You know, it's open, it looks worse on paper, right? Because it's tangible. It's concrete. It's unadjustable. It's unadjustable. 
So Moses told him, he said, yeah. And then Moses went and wrote it down. He read it and they said, yeah, we'll do it. And brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that we take God's word seriously. And listen, I know there's some of you in here, you, you, you went to, to college, you're just hearing this thing, oh, you can't trust the Bible, it's unreliable. Let me, I, w- I want to reason with the skeptics in here. And I reason with you as a fellow skeptic. I've always said, I, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up believing the Bible. I didn't have parents who said, listen, the Bible is the word of God and it's inerrant and it's infallible. It's the only rule for life and faith. And you just believe it. I grew up believing it. No, no, no. No, no, no. That was not my experience at all. I was like the classic. I never read it, but I know it's not true. And I know that the Bible's wrong. And I had all those little proof texts that people throw out there to show, oh, the Bible's so absurd. You know, and you don't know anything except these few verses that you, you, I mean, now you just Google them. But back in the day, someone just told you, oh, it says that if you curse your parents, you should be stoned. You know, and like, oh, look how absurd it is. Never, there's no depth to it. There's no thoughtfulness to it as if God is on the surface. I'm here to tell you this. Unless you do not believe that any book that you are reading at any time, whether it's the newspaper, People magazine, unless you're willing to say that that isn't really what those authors wrote, the Bible is absolutely reliable. There's so many manuscripts. Literary criticism has been very good to the Bible. Don't miss that. Classic enlightenment. We're going to disprove everything about God. Literary criticism has actually strengthened the case in the veracity of the Bible. Go to any classics department. Seriously, at any university and ask them, is the Bible, is it a reliable document of antiquity? Now, in a classics department, they're not concerned with the theology. They're concerned with documents of antiquity. See, if you go to a sociology department or religion department, they're concerned with theology. But a classics department is only concerned with documents of antiquity. So if you remove the theological component from it, is this a reliable document of antiquity? Bar none. Four times more. Four times more ancient manuscripts than the next most manuscripts, which is Homer's The Iliad. And I've never once heard someone say, Homer didn't really write The Iliad that way. Not one time. And the Bible's got four times as many manuscripts. It's funny though, but everyone, oh, you can't really trust the Bible. There's four times, there's over 1,500 manuscripts. So this book that God has given us from Genesis to Revelation, what we call the Old and the New Testament, very reliable, very reliable. And you say, oh, but there are some, there are some disputed verses. You take out those 33 disputed verses, not one of them is a necessary verse for any core doctrine of Christianity. Not one of them. You can take them all out. You can dismiss them all. You still have classic Christianity right there without those 33 verses. And you would say, oh, well then, how can it be God's word if there's disputed verses? Well, let me, let's do a reality check. These people were persecuted. It wasn't like we're in an ivy tower theological school and we're copying things like in the children of Israel's day where they had scribes where their only job was copying stuff down. These people were being persecuted first by the Jewish people, then by the Romans. If they got found with these documents, they lost their lives. They weren't meeting in beautiful churches with signs on the road saying, hey, come and worship with us. They were worshiping underground for fear of their lives. This wasn't like a a well-funded operation. People who were fishermen were writing these things down, copying them, trying to pass them around. It would make, if there wasn't any discrepancies, they would say that that proves that the the documents aren't reliable. See, when someone wants to disprove the theology of the Bible, they'll use anything. But actually, for documents of antiquity, if there is no at all confusion. They say, well, back in the day, they didn't have the printing press. They couldn't give you, like today, when you get a book, every single book looks exactly the same. It wasn't like that. It was dip, scratch, dip, scratch, parchment, smears, all these things. It was an imperfect science back then. So I say all that to talk to the skeptic. Don't cut off your nose to spite your face on the Bible. Do the homework. But listen, if you don't want to change your position on the Bible, then don't do your homework. Because if you actually look into the veracity of these documents, you're going to say, there is something different about this book. 
You will. A lot of people have tried. Trust me, I was one of them. Tried. Failed miserably, but won in failing. Because it's God's word. Don't neglect it. Spend time there. You don't have to read 9,000 chapters every day, but if you do, you'll enjoy it. Just get in the book. Read a psalm. Read the gospels. Get into Paul's writing. It's like what, listen, this is my thing. And I, I gotta move on from here. I'll be here all night. This is my thing with the Bible. The things of the spirit are spiritually discerned. The first time you read the Bible, there's gonna be all sorts of things you don't understand. And guess what? I've been reading the Bible for 15 years. There's all sorts of things I still don't understand. Pastor Bill's been reading the Bible for 55 years. There's all sorts of things he doesn't still understand. Some of you in here, like my sister Ruby, she's been reading the Bible for 90 years. And she tells me that I'm a good teacher. I'm like, that's crazy. Ruby's been reading the Bible for 90 years, but she's saying I'm a good teacher. Because listen, we never arrive spiritually. We believe in Jesus, we're cleansed, and then we're constantly growing. And so as you read through the Gospel of Matthew the first time, you learn a whole bunch of stuff. And as you read through it the 50th time, you learn a whole bunch of stuff. You read through it the 50,000th time, and you're like, I can't believe I ever read this before. I never realized that all this was in there. Why? Because we're constantly growing and God's word is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it goes down to the division of soul and spirit. Where is that division? Only God would know. Of joints and marrow. Where is that division? Only God would know. It's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our hearts as it says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. So get in that book, man. Just, just dive into it with reckless abandon. If you don't, and, and if you don't understand something, say, Lord, I don't understand that. But don't get stuck on what you don't understand because God wants to speak to you and he'll meet you right where you are. He'll meet you right where you are. God wanted us to have his word in a book. So there's no denying it. There's no, oh, it was the telephone game and we didn't really hear it all right. And it's changed. It hasn't changed. It's very, very reliable. In lots of different languages. God designed it this way. So don't be afraid of the word of God. My pastor used to always say, when he got his dad's old Bible, when he just first gave his life to Christ, he opened up the cover. And I love this. I put this in Obadiah's Bible when he was born. Little phrase. This book will keep you from sin. And sin will keep you from this book. And you know what? That's true, isn't it? When we read the word of God, it'll keep us from sin. But when we're choosing rebellion, we don't want to get into the word much, do we? Because at every single page, you're like, oh man, I am messing up. Man, the word of God will keep us from sin. It's a light to our path. It's a lamp unto our way. It shows us God's heart and God's love. So brothers, just be people of the book. You know, they have that desert island if you can only have five books. You only really need one. It's got 66 books in it. You only need one book. It's got everything you need right in there. Sure, it won't teach you how to make a good shrimp scampi, but that's why I'm around. But it'll teach you all the other good stuff, the stuff that you really need. So, so I like this. It's this. This covenant is twice affirmed, once verbally and then once in written form. Now notice also, there's also a blood offering that is involved. Now, when we read this, this is really weird, right? Because what does Moses do? He sets up an altar at the foot of the mountain, so back where the people were. He made 12 pillars, one pillar for each of the 12 tribes, symbolically speaking of the totality of the children of Israel, the totality of the people who were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were in Egypt and who were delivered. So the, all those people, what does he do? He sends out the young men. They offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. We're going to get to burnt offerings and peace offerings in the book of Leviticus. Discussed it. They're just different types of offerings that the children of Israel made. Notice, he took half the blood, he put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. So half the blood was used to sanctify or set apart the altars. The other half was put into basins. Why were they put into basins? Because after he read the book of the covenant, what did he do? He sprinkled it on the people. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was around at this point, I'd be saying this is really nasty. And let's be honest, it is really nasty. 
If, if you said, hey, I'm going to go to this sacrifice and they're going, to sac- they're going to kill some oxen and then they're going to sprinkle blood on me, we'd all say, that's crazy. What are you doing going there? But why do they do this? Because this is symbolic. Because there's going to be a greater offering that's going to be sacrificed that's going to set apart a people and that blood of that offering needs to be applied to people. How is the sacrifice, the blood of Jesus applied to you and I? By faith. Faith is the means that applies the sacrifice of Jesus to our life. That's why it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any person boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared beforehand that we'd walk in. See, we're saved by grace, which is God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. God's, the way God is, is grace. And because God is gracious, so God's grace saves us, and it's through faith. Because when we say God, yes, God takes the blood of Jesus and applies it to us. Just like the Passover sacrifice, the blood was applied to the doorpost with hyssop. Hyssop is a symbol of faith. Because faith is the means that God's sacrifice is applied to our lives. And when you take the blood of Christ and you apply it to us, we get cleansed. Though your sins were a scarlet, you will be made what? White as snow. I've said it a lot. Only in God's color wheel does crimson red sin put with the red blood of Jesus equal white as snow. God's color wheel is weird. It is. Red plus red in God's economy equals white. And there's a lot of those, right? One man plus one woman in marriage. One plus one equals one in God's economy. It's not good for kindergarten, but it is good theology. And you know what's amazing? When you think about what Paul says about the people of God, you take many members, like a room this size, some four or five hundred people gathered together on a Wednesday night, but we're one body. (laughs) That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's the way God rolls with math. He'd flunk out of kindergarten, but we like it just the same. We like it just the same. So this blood sacrifice... It was meant to be a foreshadowing. The blood of the covenant. Remember, we, we did communion on Sunday. The blood of the new covenant. He said, in my blood, this new covenant that was prophesied in the book of Jeremiah, in Christ's blood, in his blood. So notice verse 8. Moses took the blood, he sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord had made with you according to all of these words. So don't miss that. The Mosaic Covenant was still a covenant in blood. Now, before we move on, before we move on, I want to make a point because I think it's important because as you're studying the law, it's really easy to think that people got saved by keeping the law of Moses. And guess what? Nobody got saved keeping the law of Moses except for Jesus. And God never intended to save anybody with the keeping of the law of Moses. From Genesis to Revelation, God has always ever had one way of salvation, and that is through belief in his anointed one. Through belief in the anointed one. And before Jesus came, we knew his name was Jesus, and he was from Nazareth, and Mary was his mother, and and Joseph was his, his, uh, his mother's husband, and all these things. People died hoping for God's mercy, trusting in God's provision, knowing that their good works were filthy rags to God. There's only ever been one way of salvation. Because it's interesting, the church loves that it's saved by grace, but often we want to, we want to meander back towards a works-based system, don't we? I get it all the time. People say, oh yeah, you know, I don't believe in Jesus, but you need to worship on Saturday, not Sunday, because God doesn't accept that. Or you need to make sure you get baptized with the special saying, or you need to make sure that you only hear the gospel in whatever language they value, or, 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 or. And people, we want, there's a part of us in our humanity that we need to have some skin in the game. And it's, listen, it's a lot easier to affix a couple of rules that we want. 
It's a lot easier to do that than say, God wants my whole life. And I'm a living sacrifice. My life is his. That's what God really wants. God doesn't want you just to say, okay, I'm going to do it this way. Because now, I mean, the church, we're recovering our Jewish roots in, in this generation. But you get all sorts of people like, oh, yeah, you know, I keep kosher now. So I can be closer to God. It's like, well, no. Jesus gets you closer to God. You know? Or I like to do this thing or that thing. Or, and don't get me wrong. I, I think it's, it's fun to experience that history. I'm not knocking it. But it has no salvific significance. That's a good one. You guys write that down. No salvific significance. That's a good one. You roll that out tomorrow at work, and everyone will be like, okay. Do you have any creamer for the coffee? <laughs> Verse 9. Then Moses went up also, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Now... This is interesting because verses 9 to 11 is what would commonly be called a covenantal meal. So very, very symbolic in Near Eastern culture in that day that when two people made a covenant together, that covenant was made with the sacrifice. Remember God and and, uh, Abraham cutting the covenant where they made a sacrifice and they passed in between the two. And then they would sit down and have a ceremonial meal. But what's interesting about this ceremonial meal is that it says that they saw God, but notice they only talk about God's feet and what's under his feet. Because people want to say, oh, I thought no one's seen God in any time. But now it's saying that they saw God. But notice they only describe God's feet. And the implication in the Hebrew is that they never lifted up their eyes above what was under God's feet. And they noticed that it was sapphire, which was a deep blue. They said it was like the heavens, the sky. So don't miss that, that when the people of God came to make this and have this covenantal meal with God, they never lifted up their eyes. Why? Because God's so holy and he's so perfect that they weren't like, hey, Lord, what's up? You know, like, like, it's not my homeboy Jesus. This is different because this is serious. This is the God of all creation, the infinite one of infinite knowledge having a covenantal meal with finite people who are flawed. And they never lift their eyes. And don't get me wrong. All through the Bible, you find people who have different experiences of seeing God. Like remember, Moses is like, I'll show me your glory. And God's like, look, I'll show you my hind parts. My, God's like, I'll show you my back. And that's in Exodus chapter 33. We'll get there. What's amazing is that Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration saw Jesus' essential glory turned outward. But other than that, no one has seen God in his fullness. No human can, except God became a man and walked among us. See, I love the way the Lord works because God wants to be known. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He dwelt among us because God knew that in his totality, we could not handle it. So God humbled himself and became a man. Isn't that what Jesus told Philip? He's like, look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Can you imagine Philip being like, "Uh, okay, yeah. I mean, what a crazy statement. When you read the Gospels, be like, this is what God is like in a human body. Because it's easy to say Jesus is God-like, but it's hard to remember that God is Jesus-like. That the way Jesus lived and moved and carried himself in the world was the way God lives and moves and carries himself in the world. That's exactly what's going on there. But they're having this covenantal meal. That's what's going on here. Now, in verse 12, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose, verse 13, and his assistant Joshua and Moses went up to the mountain of God and he said to the elders wait here for us until we come back to you indeed Aaron and her are with you if any man has a difficulty let him go to them then Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud 
covered the mountain. Now, notice this. God calls Moses up. He says, look, I'm going to give you tablets of stone. So this is, God is going to give him the tablets of the 10 words or the 10 commandments. Those special, those unique of the commandments. Remember, we've made the case. I said it over and over again that often people say, oh, there's 10 commandments. No, no. There's only the 10 big commandments that God wrote on tablets with his very finger. Actually, the law has 613 commandments. It's a lot more than just 10. But those 10 are unique because God wrote them with his own finger. And so God tells Moses, look, I want you to come on up. I want you to come on up and I'm going to give you these tablets and I'm going to speak to you and I want you to talk to the people. Now notice what happens. In verse 13, so Moses arose with his assistant, Joshua. Do you see that? Remember before I talked about apprenticeship? After Moses dies, who takes over leading the children of Israel? Joshua. Where did Joshua learn how to do the ministry? From Moses. We're, we're going to find that eventually when the tabernacle gets set up, Moses is outside the camp. And who's hanging out there? Joshua. Joshua. Joshua was apprenticed by Moses. Now, don't get me wrong. There's lots of implications why Moses wasn't allowed to bring the children of Israel into the promised land, but Joshua was. I'll just, I'll, I'll just throw you this and then you can think about it. We'll get there later. Moses is quintessentially associated with the law. The law never brings anyone to the promised land. It only brings you to the border of the promised land. Who brings you to the promised land? Joshua. What's the Hebrew word for Joshua? Yeshua. What's the Greek word for Yeshua? Jesus. Don't, don't think that's by chance either. The law never gets you into the promised land. It only brings you to the border because it's the schoolmaster. It's Joshua who gets charged with bringing people into the promised land. That's a, be- that's a beautiful picture in God's word for us. But Moses brings, God only says Moses come. Moses brings his assistant Joshua. And Joshua's going to learn the ways of God by hanging around with Moses as Moses hangs around with God. So once again, we come back to, once again, the need for apprenticeship, for discipleship, for inviting people to come along with you, to learn with you as you are fellowshipping with God and being used by Him. Notice what he says in verse 14. Moses isn't just concerned with his own spiritual life. He's also concerned with the people around him. Look at what happens. And he said to the elders, verse 14, wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and her are here with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. I like that about Moses. Moses is like, hey, God's calling me. Peace out. I got, I got, I got time with God. Don't bother me. He realizes that there's all these people who he's responsible for. He says, listen, I got to go. I'm taking Joshi with me. Aaron and her are here. If anything goes on, they're in charge. I like that. He's following through. He's taking care of business. Good leaders do this. Good leaders take care of people even as they go on errands for God and with God. So don't miss that. Oftentimes in our selfish culture, we like to use our relationship with God to keep us from responsibility. Oh, I'd love to do that, but I need to fast and pray. Right? It's interesting. I was talking to a buddy of mine who was studying to be a rabbi. He's like, it's something so interesting. He's like, all the, all the daily prayers, according to the rabbis, had to be done at all the times that the kids needed to eat. I'm like, why did they do that? They're like, well, the men didn't want to have to deal with the kids. I'm like, that's pretty convenient. He's like, actually, it really is. You know? And, and it was, he, was, he, was, he was in rabbinical school. He's a great guy. Cool. We've had a lot of cool conversations, but it's funny. So don't, don't use your relationship with God as an opportunity to not be responsible for your responsibilities. That's what Pharisees do. That's what Pharisees do. They, they use those things as things to block taking care of the business that God has. But Moses is taking care of the people. Aaron and her are in charge until I come back. Notice verse 15. Then Moses went up into the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 
nights. Now, this, I would love to do a series on those four or five verses because this is some deep stuff and I can get real out there mystical on you in the midst of this. And I'm, I'm going I'm to save you from some of that stuff. But there's some really cool things in here. Notice first, notice first that God was in the midst of a cloud which means that part of the presence of God is undefined for us. When you think, I mean, listen, we know clouds, right? We live here in Washington State. We do clouds, right? Clouds are not clear, crystal clear skies. They, act, they actually obscure things. And part of the way God works in our lives is to keep certain things undefined. That there is a mystery involved to it. That's the big failing of Christianity in the West based on the Enlightenment, like systematic theology. I'm a big fan of systematic theology, but everyone's trying to put everything about God in a nice little neat scientific box. And guess what God does when you try and stick him in a box? He pops the top off. He breaks through the sides because God is not something to put in a nice little neat box and wrap a bow on it. He's God. And we need to maintain in all of our theological Boxing that we like to do. We need to maintain a holy sense of mystery because God still exists in a cloud. There's part of what God is doing that we will never understand, yet we keep asking him to help us understand. It's such a fascinating picture. It's a cloud. But not only that, look at what happens. He tells Moses to go up, and does God show up on time? The answer is no. The cloud covered Mount Sinai for six days and the glory of the Lord rested there for six days and on the seventh day he called to Moses in the midst of the cloud. That means that Moses had to hang around in the glory of God in the cloud for six days before God started talking to him. Now that's hard for us, isn't it? Because we got schedules. We got places we need to be. We're very important people. And if you don't update your Facebook status at least four times a day, something's obviously wrong. Sometimes God is hidden on purpose. And one of the hardest things we have in our culture is that because we're used to everything immediate, if God does not speak immediately, we think we're forsaken when sometimes God waits to see if we're really ready. You would think that God called him up. He's going to get it done. Moses is going to be back in a couple of hours. It takes six days for God to start talking, and Moses is there for 40 days and 40 nights. This is not like a quick process. It's not like an, an outpatient, you know, a, an outpatient surgery. Where you go in, you're out at home in two hours. This takes some time to happen. This takes some time. And your relationship with God is the same way. God is not always going to speak to you just because you want to hear his voice because God knows that hiddenness sometimes gets us farther than manifestation. And sometimes God makes you wait because waiting is healthy. It reminds us that it's on God's timetable and not our own. And isn't that, I know that there's some of us in here right now, you're struggling in your relationship with God because God has you waiting and you want to be going. But be okay to, if God summons you like he summoned Moses to the mountaintop, he might not speak right away. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. It doesn't mean any of those things. It means that God is more concerned with the process than we are concerned with the outcome. Listen, you gals who've had children, you know when you get pregnant, you just like, you're excited. You just can't wait to see that baby, but it still takes nine months. And, and, no, matter, and no matter how, uh, me and Lynn were talking about this just the other day. She's like, oh, I remember when, remember when I was eight months pregnant with Maranatha? I just was, I felt like such a whale. You know what I mean? And I guess you ladies know how that feels. I, I wouldn't know, but you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, but you just, I just want this baby out. But things happen in their own time. And you can't rush perfection. And that's the way God works. But we live in an impatient culture, don't we? We live in a culture that says, if God doesn't speak to you in two seconds, then maybe God isn't there. And a lot of us have bought that. It takes, even though the glory is there, the cloud is there, Moses is hanging out up there because God asked him to be there, God still didn't speak for six days. 
And then on the seventh day, God started to speak. Notice what happens. Notice what happens. In verse 17, the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Moses is up there in the cloud and the people who are watching it looks terrifying. A consuming fire was not something that you wanted to go run into. It was something that you run away from. Imagine seeing Mount Hood on fire on a clear day. That's what it looked like. God's glory was like a fire that was consuming the mountaintop and Moses is hanging out up there. Don't miss, I mean, you can realize how mystical people can get really into this stuff. But you see what's going on here. The presence of God, when God really shows up, oftentimes does not look like somewhere that a lot of people want to be. Don't miss that. But Moses is right in the middle of it. And notice what happens, verse 18. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights. Now, don't miss 40 days and 40 nights, obviously, is a biblical idiom. We know it, it rained in the flood for 40 days, for 40 nights. Pops up in a lot of different places. But from here, Moses on the mountaintop, starting in chapter 25, going to the end of the chapter, you're going to get God giving Moses absolutely specific details about how he wants the people to worship him. Every single piece of furniture, how it's to be made, its dimensions, every single curtain, how it's to be stitched, what kind of, what kind of metal he wants for the grommets, what kind of poles he wants. Every single detail Moses is going to get while he's up on this mountain in the presence of the glory of God. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to close with this here. I believe God wants us in the presence of his glory that is a consuming fire. Because in the presence of God's glory, we died to ourselves and we are made alive and conformed into the image of Christ. You cannot be you and conformed into the image of Christ at the same time. It's not possible. You cannot fill to overflowing an already full cup. It has to be first emptied so that God could fill. And I believe God wants each one of us in his presence, letting him empty us of ourselves so that he can fill us up and overflow us with him. But don't, don't miss it. That's in the consuming fire. But that fire is a refining fire and we come out the other side better than when we got in there. And we should be okay with that because that is how God changes people. He doesn't change you because I just decided I want to be different. He changes you because he burns off the stuff that binds you. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were dropped into that fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, they were in there, three guys. When they came out, Nebuchadnezzar saw four guys in there, one like the son of God. When they came out, they didn't smell like smoke. They weren't singed at all. But you know what was missing? The things that they were bound by when he sent them in. The only thing that changed about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the midst of that fiery furnace is that when they left, the things that were binding them were gone. And that's what happens in the presence of the Lord in the consuming fire. The only thing that changes about you is the things that hold you back from him are gone. So if you're here today and you want to be a conqueror, you want to be an overcomer, you want to take those next steps with Jesus, you need to step into the fire with Jesus where his glory is. You'll suffer loss, but the things that you lose are the things that you never wanted anyway, the things that held you back, the things that held you down. And he'll set us free because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you for this book. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for meeting us in the cloud, that cloud of unknowing, that mystery. And Lord, I ask that you would, in all of our learning, and we love learning, in all of our reading, and we love reading, in all of our information, and we're so grateful to such access of such information that, Lord, we would always maintain that healthy sense of mystery. Forgive us for trying to stick you in a box. Lord, you are way too glorious to be simply studied 
and boxed. Lord, you are wild in your freedom. And God, we ask that we would step into that consuming fire of your glory. Each one of us, Lord, that we wouldn't be afraid, that, Lord, we would come boldly to you, come boldly to your word, come boldly to fellowship, come boldly to apprenticeship and discipleship. And, Lord, that you would simply set us free from the things that hold us back from being the men and women that you have called us to be. And, Father, for each one of us in here, you know each one of us. Lord, for some of us in here, Lord, we ask that you would help us to take those next steps with you. For some of us, for the very first time tonight, as you commit your life to Jesus, as you, with faith, you just receive that cleansing, that faith that applies the blood of Jesus, that, Lord, I ask that you would give the gift of faith to many in here tonight for the first time. Lord, for others of us, that you would give us a fresh faith to believe that you are who you say you are and you are up to what you say you are doing. And Father, for some of us who have been walking real close with you, Lord, we want to go deeper with you. We want to get deep into your heart. Lord, we want you to continue to cleanse, to to set us free tonight. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's family said, Amen.